Andrew started telling a little bit of my story, but, but I'm a preacher's kid. Do we have any preacher's kids here? Do we see? Okay, one. Is there anyone else? Okay. Because we relate to one another. Well, preacher's kids do. Um, we live in this world of um, uh, supposedly knowing this better than anybody else, that we're supposed to be really well behaved. Um, we're kind of watched with a different set of eyes, but I, I don't know. We, we have to talk later. We go to special counseling afterwards, uh, but, but we, have, we have an understanding. But I grew up as a preacher's kid. I come from a family of eight children. I'm number, I'm number six, so I have two younger brothers, uh, one of them that, that teaches music over at Harding Academy, my youngest brother. Um, and so... I have some unique stories about that. that that's a different topic, but um, a lot of fun growing up there. Um, I have a family of my own. I have four children that have all um, they started in Wisconsin. I moved to Wisconsin or moved from Wisconsin to Arkansas in 2001, and uh, my oldest was a junior in high school. Or yeah, junior in high school. And then I had kids that went down from there. They have now all gone through Harding, graduated. I, had twin daughter, I have twin daughters that graduated a couple of years ago. All four of them are music majors. Now, my wife's a music teacher, so you know who they really paid attention to, who they really listened to, who they really respected. Uh, but they all, they all fell in love with music and uh, be, uh, have started different points of career there. Um, I chose banking, and I can't even really tell you why. Um, I know that back in the day that uh, financial services and those who worked in it were people who were trusted, and so maybe part of it was that I thought that uh, being that, doing that job, that it was uh, a place where people uh, would, would trust me. Um, but I always knew, and I know that some of you don't know that. You come into this... Um, this college experience, maybe not even understanding or knowing your major. Um, I talked to someone yesterday who's getting ready to graduate in May, and I asked him, what are you doing in a few weeks? He said, I don't know. And I said, well, graduation, what are we, five weeks? We're five weeks away from graduation. I said, it's the morning after graduation, what are you going to do? He said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, where are you going to live? He said, I don't know. I always knew, and, I don't, and again, I can't tell you why, but I knew that I wanted to return to Wisconsin, and I, I knew why I wanted to do that, and I knew that I wanted to somehow end up in, in the financial services industry, and, and that's actually what uh, uh, God did for me and where I ended up. W Andrew mentioned this, but when I was at Harding, vocational ministry was something that was taught out of the College of Business. And it was taught in a way that basically said, God gave you talents. And in this case, he gave you talents in the area of business. So you should use those talents wherever you go, understanding that they were God-given, and that, that God can take that and you can use it for his kingdom. And so that wherever you go, that if you're in the field of business, if you're in the field of education, if you're in the field of, of something outside of ministry, and it's not to say anything against ministry, but to say that there's a lot of people that are outside of ministry, that that can be where God uses you, and that's where you, sh you should be used. So in 1990, um, there was a small church in Wisconsin in the city of Beaver Dam, that needed a minister. Well, in Wisconsin, the churches are really, really small, and so they weren't ready to, to spend $80,000 a year uh, or whatever the salary would be to, to pay for someone to come in and preach full-time. And so what they did is they said, hey, we're looking for someone who can work a full-time job and minister to this church. And I thought, wow, this is what Harding trained me for. This is, this, this, sounds, this is it. This is what I'm supposed to do. And so I started it, and I found out it wasn't easy. I did find out one thing. I would never be a full-time minister. 
by the way. I, I, I found that out really, really early doing this. Um, but I found out that there was so much joy and that there was so much that I could do from being in the marketplace that other ministers couldn't do. That they just didn't have the opportunities and the reach that, that, I, that I did. And I would tell you that that's where you're going to be. Most of you are going to be in the marketplace. You're going to be in the school systems. You're going to be in private practice. You're going to be somewhere, but you're going to be... You're not going to be a paid, you're not going to be paid ministry staff, most of you. And so you have to determine, can God use that? Let me tell you a story about this. As, uh, um, I had started work at, at a bank, and uh, I was in my office on a normal day, uh, had started the day and was working, and my office, the administrative staff, was right outside my door, and they had you know, a really big work area, and I could normally see them, and they would see me. And I, I looked out one, one day as I was working, and I could see that they, they were kind of uh, talking amongst themselves, and they would look at my office, and they'd talk amongst themselves, and they'd look at my office, and I'm going, okay, something's happening where they're talking about me. And, you know, I'm okay with that most of the time. Uh, and then one of them breaks loose from the group and comes to my office, and sheepishly knocks on the outside. The door's open, but sheepishly knocks on the outside of the door. And she peeks in her head and she goes, Are you a reverend? And I said, What? I said, What makes you ask that question? And they said, Well, there's someone online too that wants to speak to Reverend Frazier. <laughs> so I went ahead and took the call. And then I had to go back out and tell them, okay, you, you got to understand that I've told the local newspaper not to use that term, but in the newspaper under the Church of Christ in Beaverdam, Wisconsin, the contact person said Reverend Alan Frazier. And so she thought that I was a reverend and had some special gift or something, um, and so I had to explain it to her. And, but it was a great opportunity to discuss with her what it meant to be um, sold out for God and what it meant to, 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 to have a relationship with God. And I have another couple stories about that before I'm done. Um, let, me, let me read to you one of my favorite passages, or not passages, a uh, reading from, it's a, it's a devotional Bible. And the title of this uh, little segment is called Workbenches and Altars. And here's what Ted Engstrom and David Giroux say. For millions, work is a drudgery, a grim necessity. Many hate their work every day of their lives, and many find escapes in harmful ways to counterbalance that drudgery. Ask career counselors. Some estimate that as high as 90% of the labor market see themselves as victims trapped in an unfulfilled daily round of work. That sounds awful, doesn't it? It does to me. <laughs> Certainly, if Christianity is going to be relevant, it, has to, it must say something about the problem. There's a Christian philosophy of the family, education, history. Why not a Christian philosophy or a theology of work? One unfortunate development during the long history of the Christian church was the view during the medieval period that there was a separation of laity and clergy. This difference, uh, the difference between the sacred and secular calling still exists. In the architecture of early European cathedrals, a screen separated the people from the priests because of the common view which held that working people had not been called of God as their clergy had. Therefore, they had to worship apart. Martin Luther saw the, the fallacy in this and courageously spoke out against it. He tore down the screen, and from him we get this, the idea of vocational guidance. He said that man in his worthier callings is called just as surely as a man who is called to the priesthood or ministry. Christianity 
has always provided a connection between work and worship. Men can dignify labor by doing ordinary things as redeemed people. There lies the difference, and there is where the drudgery dissipates. God is in it. That means that every workbench in a plant is an altar. The psalmist says, may the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us, establish the work of our hand for us. So you see, we can please the Lord by our work. I would even go further than that to say that God defines your work. That, that every office, that every classroom, that every lab, that every doctor's office, every nurse's station is an altar. And that's where God has placed you. That is where God has called you, and that's the platform that he's given you. I told you, I chose banking. I believe God could use my talents, that he could use my leanings for his kingdom. Um, And so I think one of the questions we have to grapple with is, okay, what if I am called outside of the paid ministry? And and I, I just find it fascinating that sometimes, even at Harding, we have lifted as holy those things which involve missions. And I'm, I'm not telling you that they're not holy. But what I'm telling you is that going to work in an insurance building is holy. Mm-hmm. Going to work in a school teaching children is holy. Right. Going to, to work as a, a dentist or a doctor or a nurse or a lab assistant or as for the state of Arkansas and for a government office is holy. And I think sometimes we, we feel like, well, wait, how, how can God use that? How can God bless that? Let me tell you the story of a guy named Jim Derivan. When I met Jim, he drove a beer truck, okay? And I met Jim in the community, just being out and about, and the about is Wisconsin about, if you didn't catch that. Um, I, was, I was watching the, uh, the, the uh, Republican, whatever that was called, town hall the other day, and I heard from in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I heard these guys talking, and I'm like, do I sound like that? Is that, is, and you're going, you guys are going, yeah, you do, you sound like that. Um, but I met Jim Derivan uh, in the community, he's driving a beer truck. And I, talk, I talked to him, and just as a, a friend to a friend, and I said, you sure you want to do that? I mean, you know, do you know what happens? And, and it's not that necessarily you're drinking it, but do you know what happens when people drink that stuff? And, and we talked, and we talked, and he was like, hey, you know, it's a job. I need a job. Jim had a college degree. Um, well, I had moved into a position of, uh, in charge of a marketing division for a bank, and uh, all of a sudden, Jim Dervin appears. Well, Jim had now become a media rep for the local newspapers. So he was selling media ads and radio ads. So I, you know, I was happy for Jim, and Jim and I started talking about um, that transition and how happy I was for him. Well, to, 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 to quicken the story, well, then Jim and I started talking, and I asked Jim and his wife if they wanted to come to my house. And he was like, sure, I'll come to your house. And so at first, we, he just came to my house, and we had coffee and dessert. Well, then I said, hey, Jim, on, on Thursday nights, we, we have, we call them life talks. It was a disguise. No, I'm not. I'm kidding. But, you know, we call them life talks. And I, I said, you know, we, we sit and talk about life, but what we do is we, we talk about how the Bible connects to that. Would you and your wife like to come to that? And he said, yeah, we'll do that. Well, so Jim and Sharon, his wife, started coming to a Thursday night life talk in our house, and there were like two or three other couples. And we started sharing the gospel with him through life, talking to him about, you know, the day and things that are going on in marriage and things that are going on with his kids and things that are going on with work. And we connected the Bible to all that and made it relevant. Well, Jim and Sharon became Christians. 
And Jim, who I didn't, I don't go to all the rest, but Jim was not known for a clean mouth. And Jim was not known for always saying the right things. He was kind of boisterous and, and sometimes inconsiderate and sometimes rude. And you're going, well, he sounds like he's from Wisconsin, right? And I'm, you know. But so as we started talking to him, all of this started happening. And I was telling this to Pamela last night, telling, him, telling her I was telling the story. And, it, and it, it got, I got emotional because one of the things I remember is Sharon watching Jim transform. Sharon was a beautiful woman who loved God, but, but, was, but also loved her husband no matter where he was. And I remember vividly a picture as we were loading up our, we had loaded our trucks to move to, to Arkansas, and we had to park them in, a, in the church parking lot for a week because we had to get all of our stuff loaded so that people could move into our house. But we had about a week where we were kind of nomads. And so I remember, though, when that week was over, we went to the parking lot to jump in our trucks and start the caravan to Arkansas. And there was one person standing outside the truck, and it was Sharon Derivan. And she was holding a basket of goodies with tears streaming down her face because we were leaving. And I think, and I don't know all the thoughts that were going through her mind, but I think she was saying, you influence my husband, and that influence is now leaving. That's the power, what I would tell you, that you have as a person called to do what God has asked you to do in the marketplace. Through that, and I'm not saying a paid minister would never have had that opportunity, but I'm telling you that the paid minister would never have that opportunity. That's an opportunity that could have only existed in the position that God had placed me in. And God gets all the glory, but God knows exactly how to use you and put, put you where you need to be. The bank calling and other callings, and I have other stories like that, but I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time. The the that, that's not an unusual story. There are other ones that followed that happened because God had placed me in a, in a vocation where he knew people needed God. Andrew asked a couple things about, you know, what did you learn as a preaching banker? And I think that's one of the things I learned was that certainly I need a Savior. Never forgot that. Never do today. I, there's a song that I love, and the, the, that's the, the key phrase, I'm still a man in need of a Savior. And I think that what I found out is that whether people are in Honduras starving to death or whether people are in, are in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the 17th floor of a high-rise working in a, in a business, they need a Savior. They need to understand a relationship with God. Who is going to reach them? Now, if you go to Honduras to the people who are starving and poor and, in, and near the dumps of Tegucigalpa, they need a Savior. But if you're there, you can't reach the guy in the 17th floor of a high-rise in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, working in a business. They have to have people there just like in Honduras. Both need reached. Both are holy callings. Here's what I tell you. I'm going to wrap up with three things. I would tell you to be intentional about your calling through these, these things. Remember your roots. Galatians 6.3 basically is talking about um, service, but it, but it, but it says um, those that think you're important, remember you're not. And I think what he's saying is, remember you're not too important. Now, I do think you're important, but remember that you're not too important for God to use you in any way he deems necessary. And so I think sometimes we, we need to be reminded of our roots that none of us were called that we're perfect. None of us are perfect. None of us are that great. And... And I think sometimes we do think that we're, <laughs> that we're great. And I think God reminds us often, those that think you're great, 
you might as well get over that. You are not really that great, and you're not too great to do what I need you to do. I'd say the second thing is to remember your purpose. Your purpose is not to praise yourself. Your purpose is not to, to make your name great. Your purpose is not to get rich. Your purpose is not to gain authority over other people. Your, your purpose is not to make other people feel small. You're not, your purpose is not to become sufficient or self-sufficient. Your purpose is to make God's name great and advance His kingdom and to serve others where you are. And let God figure out where you are. I think a lot of times we figure, well, we, 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 we're like, I can see the best job in the world, and that's the one I want. But for some reason, God's telling me or giving me these three jobs, and they're not the jobs I want. Well, I'm convinced that there is less coincidence than you might think in life. And I think sometimes we, even in these settings, we're like, well, I, are, are, are we all taking this for one hour credit? Is that what we're doing? I'm not. But we all take it. And I think sometimes, well, I'm here just because I needed one hour. Yeah, coincidence? I don't know. I, w- I would give God much more credit than, than that. Uh, remember your limits. And I have stories and stories of this, but you don't know everything. You have limited time and energy, and every time... Every time you do something, you've traded it for something else. And I think sometimes we have been taught that I can do it all. I can, I can work 80 hours a week, and I can keep current, and I can, I can be a great parent, and I can be great in this, and I can be great involved. Well, guess what? You can't. You have limited time and energy, and you have a choice. And every time you choose something, you, you lose something else. And that I wish that I could say that you could spend all the energy and time doing everything you want and be great at it, but you have limited time and you are not, you are not morally invincible. There are, there are so many times I have failed and failure that has hurt, hurt me, hurt others. And I think it was those times that I thought, look what God is doing with me and I, I, won't, I won't fall. And so the scripture that says, those that think you stand, take heed, is really, really true. So I hope that maybe just a few things that I've said have helped. I would remind you that God has given you a platform, and He will give you a platform, and it is just that, your platform to spread His kingdom, to do His work, to do His service, and every one of them is holy.